Copenhagen in uh, December 2009. The climate change conference had just ended with a splash like a handful of wet newspaper. Obama had uh, flown home. Um, we were all going around with the kind of uh, mixture of uh, uh, anxiety and frustration that has got perhaps more and more familiar over the five or six years since. Um, I'd also just lost my job a few days before, so that was kind of amplified by a feeling of uh, a desire for revenge on uh, my previous, previous boss. And I was, uh, cycling, I was cycling through the city on the way to a Christmas party, and I suddenly noticed by the side of the road um, this little village of beehives. And I was intrigued. I'd uh, cycled that way 20 times before and somehow never noticed that they'd, that they'd been there. And I decided to find out more. And what I discovered in these boxes, uh, you can see here in the picture, what I discovered was a bit like finding a portal to a magical parallel kingdom. It was like running into platform nine and three quarters in King's Cross. It was like finding a whole world that existed underneath the world that we live in now and, and, and experience every day that I'd never known had been there and yet had somehow been enormously influential on the reality that we saw around us. Honeybees are completely fascinating and fantastic creatures. Inside each box, you've got around 60,000 buzzing, sniffing, licking, dancing, tickling honeybees. They're incredibly communicative. There's not just a queen and workers. What you find when you dive into this kind of dark, smelly space, what you find is that there's uh, cleaners, there's builders, there's bees that are responsible for looking after the babies, there's guards, there's scouts, there's all sorts of different sorts of functions. There's actually also researchers have discovered there's something called uh, lazy bees. If you watch this kind of chaos of, of movement and follow the individual bees backwards and forwards, it turns out that quite a high proportion of them are just walking backwards and forwards. Oops. Walking backwards and forwards, holding a piece of paper under their arms, looking like they're busy, and no one really knows exactly what they're doing. <laughs> bees, as I said, communicate through scent, smell, and sight. And the conversations they have aren't just with each other. It's also a conversation they have with plants, plants and flowers. So there's this magical experience you have if you get up early enough in the morning. You can see the enthusiasm among these creatures to get out and, and, and get going among the flowers. You see them lining up along the edge of the beehive, ready to go as soon as the temperature climbs up, up enough for them to go out and fly. Bees, when they uh, fly to a flower... They see colors that we can only just imagine in our human, human worlds. Um, they uh, have 72 scent receptors, so they can taste the individual flowers, communicate exactly which flower they landed on to their sisters when they fly back to the hive and where it's been. So that flower is different from that flower. They um, have these hairs on their bodies, the kind of hairy creatures. Each hair is a kind of sensual organ for communicating with the world around them. So when a bee flies into a flower uh, and, and pollinates it, the static electricity in that flower changes, and when she flies to the next one, she can actually feel on her body if another bee has been there recently. So you have to try and imagine what it's like for a bee in a city like Brighton or Copenhagen in the summer, the sun's shining, the smells and scents and colours are washing out of the plants as the trains go through the kind of green corridors. Um, how are the parks? What do the flower beds and gardens look like when you're in it? It's an incredibly rich world that these, these animals inhabit. And if you think bees are funky, you should meet the beekeepers. <laughs> um, beekeepers are mostly male. Honeybees are almost all female. Uh, beekeepers are also uh, furry in their own way, mostly <laughs> kind of bearded. Um, the first beekeeper I met, he told me the origin story of uh, the honeybee. This is apparently true. That if you go back in, in time, 100 million years, the world was basically black and white. Uh, the late Cretaceous, there were dinosaurs and volcanoes and bamboo and that kind of stuff. Uh, one day, the first primitive bee flew from the first primitive flower over to the next primitive flower and discovered a new kind of sexual relationship. Pollination. Uh, if you look in the fossil record, you can see that from this black and white world in just a few tens of millions of years, um, everything that we associate with the richness and bounty of the world today, so colour, taste, smell, 
all of the fruits, juicy strawberries and apples, all of the sticky things that sustain not just human life, but also the lives of all the other insects and animals and birds that survive on it, emerged out of that pollination. An enormous amount of productivity which turned the world on its head. And it occurred to me when I found out about this that this is basically the model that we're all reaching after. as a model that includes the partnership between bees and flowers. It's the pleasure. This is a sexual relationship. They're not doing this. We think of bees as being hardworking, but they're not doing it because they're working hard. They're doing it because it feels great. Anyone who's seen those kind of slow motion pictures of flowers opening, you can't also imagine that it's not enormously pleasurable for the flower to be pollinated by a tickling, tickling bee coming inside it. <laughs> So this is about pleasure, this is about productivity, this is about partnership, and it's about a form of production that doesn't erode and destroy the world as we do as human beings, but enriches it. And it's like it's this mirror to the world in which we live in now. And it occurs to me that maybe the, the, the greatest challenge of our time today is to actually have these two worlds meet each other, is to actually find out how can we produce industries, how can we make things that enrich and enliven and uh, make our world both socially and environmentally richer. This is not sustainability, this is beyond sustainability. Sustainability is about keeping things the same. This is about making things more colourful and juicier. And how do we get there from the world as it is today? I, I thought that I'd take this quite literally and uh, decided to make an urban honey company in Copenhagen uh, producing honey in the city. But before I tell you about how that went, um, I would uh, like to uh, give a bit of context we all know about the wonderful Danish uh, social democratic state. Well, I mean, this is a, a, a system that has become significantly worse in the last 10 years, like a lot of the rest of Europe. There is a regime in Denmark at the moment that is tearing chunks out of the welfare system, that is pushing tens of thousands of people into poverty. Um, the Danish government at the moment has a policy towards refugees and immigrants, which is basically to make his life as unpleasant and uncomfortable for them as possible. Um, these policies are driven by an ideological belief in a lot of ways that the way in which we can get uh, poor, sick, uh, traumatized people to play a role in society is to force them to work, um, get them into jobs. It is in a world where 50% of jobs are vanishing as a result of technology, as we've heard today, a mindless utopia that they're trying to, uh, trying to emphasize. So before I talk about my business, I think it's really important to emphasize here that um, as entrepreneurs, we're given a platform, and it's important that we use that platform to fight for a political framework which is fairer to these sorts of people. That means fair benefits. It means, as we talked about today, fighting and using our voice to say that we need some kind of universal basic income. As producers of physical products, we also have a huge opportunity. We have an opportunity to knock our customers. <laughs> don't know why they put this water here. That's the second I spill now. I hope it's one left. <laughs> um, uh, we have a responsibility to our, our customers and our suppliers to knock them out of their silos, out of their social and political silos. Who makes this stuff? Where does it come from? Who is it? It doesn't matter if it's honey, if it's a biro, if it's your notebook. All these physical objects we surround ourselves in the world, they come from people. And those people have names and faces, and we need to show what those names and faces are. Um, and finally, I think it's important that again and again we emphasize how important it is to, uh, that the social and the political side are, are the same, that these areas are linked. So I'll give you an example. This is uh, Arif. He's one of our colleagues. He's a, a beekeeper, one of the three beekeepers we have working for us. He's uh, from Syria. Arif came to Denmark two years ago. Um, he came from uh, Turkey, Greece, overland uh, through Italy and arrived in Denmark. Arif was a beekeeper outside Aleppo in a small village for 17 years before he came to Denmark. Um, when he first came into our office, he was presented by, by, by the job center. He couldn't speak a word of Danish, and he came in. And we could see on his body that he had so much he wanted to express, but, but couldn't. He just didn't have the vocabulary for it. And yet you could just see in his thumbs, in his hands, the way he picked up and smelt the wax and the bees and the equipment he had this sort of sense of relief, this sense of familiarity, this sense of belonging back with, uh, with, with, with the beekeepers. He's learned 
at Danish now, um, and he is now responsible for looking after about 250 beehives over the whole of Copenhagen. They're on the roof of the city hall, they're on the roof of this amusement park, they're on water utilities, they're on um, uh, big corporate businesses. Here he is at the airport. We work with both businesses and social projects. So businesses actually pay us to put bees on their rooftops and their car parks in bits of used land. And we use that money to uh, train new beekeepers and work in other areas and, and conduct different sorts of events with that. Arif isn't just looking after the bees and producing this honey, he's also um, teaching and training. Uh, we think it's really important to involve all of the communities in the city in producing, in producing honey and, and, and working with the bees. So a rift together with an English woman, um, a Sudanese guy, has been teaching a group of 25 other refugees in a park in central Copenhagen. They come from Afghanistan, from Sudan, from Africa, from uh, Bangladesh. And uh, the bees they're looking for, looking after, are flying out from this park. They're flying whether they like it or not, into the window boxes and parks, into people's gardens. They're pollinating their apples and strawberries and producing a honey that our project is then buying back and selling onwards to the people who come to Copenhagen. Put a wall around that, you fuckers. <laughs> We're also working with... Um, we're working with uh, other community projects, with formerly homeless. We've got projects in two housing, houses, social housing estates and in other deprived areas, bringing these people together to uh, help them look after the bees. For these people, it's not a job. They're not going to be able to work as beekeepers, but it gives them a sense of belonging. It gives them a role in the community that we're able to symbolize with the honey that they, they produce. Honey is a wonderful, magical substance um, so we're also working with uh, families and children. Kids get this stuff immediately, so when you bring groups of children into, uh, into the factory, they can immediately see uh, the connection between people, environment, and bees. Like I said, honey is a, it's a bit like oil. You can make it into all sorts of other products. So we work with other local producers to make honey into ice cream, into candies, uh, into beer, and rum, you can see here. These are things that we sell to supermarkets and use this to finance the project. But perhaps the thing that I love most about the project, I talked, starting off, talking about this kind of secret, magical world that exists under the surface of our world as it is today, is that when you begin to produce honey over the whole city, you realize that every street, every garden, every window box, every park has its own taste and its own flavor. It's a taste and a flavor that contains the stories of the people who looked after the bees, the businesses that had them on their roofs, the people who planted the flowers. It's a taste and flavor that changes from year to year. So what you harvest on this date from this district this year will change the year after. It's a picture that changes constantly, shifting in color and taste and flavor according to the flowers that we choose to produce and results in this and I've just got four, but last year we had uh, 65 different colors and different tastes of honey from the whole city. And when you bring all these things together, you get a whole different picture of what the city of Copenhagen looks like. And that's what we're trying to do in our, in our project. And that's why we say honey is something that you make together. Thanks. <laughs>